It's good to see all of you here tonight in the book of Esther as we continue our studies. Hope you'll be sure and remember Gayla Luna. She has a knee replacement in the morning, and uh, she certainly would covet your prayers, and we want to remember her and Beth Enlow as Beth is still recuperating as she is at the rehab out of Delk Crossing. Want to continue to pray for her. We have Bill Brown out in the hospital. Want to pray for him. Jackie Waldo went back to the nursing home today, and we certainly want to lift Jackie and Peggy up and Danny and Tina. I know Danny has a heavy load, and I hope you will be sure and remember him. Also, his brother, Doug, who is taking uh, treatments, and so we want to uh, be sure and pray for them. And uh, let me think who else is out there. Pat Hooper is also out there. We want to remember Pat Hooper and uh, Juanita uh, is Brown is back at the nursing home, but uh, Bill's in isolation, so you wouldn't, wouldn't need to go and visit him there at the hospital. And uh, Juanita went back to, uh, to the nursing home, and she still has some uh, issues there. But we want to continue to remember all of these and uh, uh, continue to remember Levita Alexander as well. And... Uh, God bless you for your prayer life and for uh, praying for the many needs of people that are out there uh, day by day by day. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Last Wednesday evening, we looked at chapter 2, verses 19, uh, to the end of that chapter. But I want to go back and discuss something in chapter 19 and uh, following, and as we get into chapter 3 uh, for this evening, uh, two things that happened in chapter 2 that was a huge uh, situation. And the, the first one is, of course, the finding and the crowning of a new queen, uh, Queen Esther. But the other thing is a, an assassination plot that uh, was devised to uh, take out King Ahasuerus. You may call him King Xerxes. He goes by both of those in different translations. Uh, and in the midst of that, it wasn't by accident that Mordecai was in the right place at the right time to hear about this assassination plot against the king. Everything, wherever you look, all through the book of Esther. One of the amazing things to me about this incredible book is the incredible sovereignty of Almighty God and how he works for his eternal purposes and for his eternal plans. And so oftentimes we'll say, by chance I did such and such, or it was great luck. But you know, I think whenever it comes to a born-again child of God's life, I don't think it's luck and circumstances. I think it's the sovereignty of Almighty God and the way he moves and works in the hearts and lives of his people based upon his uh, perceptive eternal purposes in that individual's life. I've quoted before and said, God's too good to be unkind. God's too wise to be mistaken. God is too deep to be explained. And um, you and I will never be able to understand many of the things that happen in our lives. Uh, there are lots of things that happen that are not so great, not so good. But, but in the midst of it all, God stands as our helper, our defense, our refuge, our strength, our hope, our comfort through the Holy Spirit, and we know that in the midst of all that takes place in life, that God is working out all things for our good and for his glory. In verse 19 of chapter 2, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai, notice this, sat within the king's gate. Now, what he was doing there in this particular uh, seating of uh, there in the king's gate, whether it was something he had been uh, appointed to do or it was just where people gathered and there were obviously all kinds of news reports uh, that uh, you could garner in a setting such as that. 
A lot of you love to go to the mall and walk or go to the Simmons Center and walk or go to the coffee shop and talk. And uh, these become places. I see some of you grinning. You know what I'm talking about. They become places to get prayer requests. But they also become places where information is disseminated for you to pray about, but it kind of becomes a little bit of gossip. Do you all know what I'm talking about out there? Well, anyway, I'll quit meddling and get back to my topic here. But uh, life is filled with greeting and meeting places, and all kinds of information is shared and disseminated in those particular venues, and oftentimes uh, we can even glean from those venues things that we need to know about. I've had people in those venues call me, Pastor, did you know so-and-so lost a so-and-so? Did you know so-and-so was having surgery? So there's lots of good things that come out of those myths. Mordecai is sitting within the king's gate. Verse 20 said, now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him in those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gate two of the king's eunuchs big then and Teresh, doorkeepers and that doorkeeper means that they made sure that the door to the king's bedchamber that he was secure. Uh, They would be his quote-unquote bodyguards who watched over him just as uh, Jeremiah would be the cupbearer. He would be the one to taste the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned before the king would partake of it. These two eunuchs here, Big Thin and Teresh, doorkeepers uh, to the king there, his bedchamber, notice became furious. And this is what I want to speak about for the next few minutes for this evening. I want you to think with me, and you can verbalize with me back and forth, so don't be afraid to shout it out. What are some things that make people angry and furious? What makes you angry and furious? By not getting your own way, that's probably uh, the whole summation of anything that we could say is because basically humanity is a selfish tribe of people, isn't it? And in our selfishness, our self-centeredness, in our narcissistic attitudes, uh, we uh, often want our own way. Under that umbrella, what are some other things that make people angry and furious? Nita. The mistreatment of children. Yes, did any of you read, uh, I believe it was yesterday on Christian Post, where uh, the FBI in a sting operation had confiscated 200 in the sex trafficking scheme in the Texas area. And uh, some of the big names of of professions, of people that were involved in those things. Yes, Nita, I think the abuse of children, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, neglectful abuse of, of feeding children properly and clothing feeding, that is one of the things, yes, that I think certainly um, becomes uh, the sand in the pearl's oyster of life whenever we look at the uh, terrible way that children are being treated. Bill, thank you for that comment. John, you had one. (laughs) Getting a telemarketer on the phone that does not speak your lingo. Any of y'all there? or to get a telemarketer on the phone, or you call them, and uh, you have to go through 10 different automated voices to hear what, y'all know what I'm talking about, what John's talking about? Lloyd, you had your hand up. (laughs) People that does not pay attention when you're trying to talk with them. Yeah, you know, one of the... uh, uh, Four words that I think are hugely important is this. Do you 
see me? Do you hear me? Yeah, that's a good one, Lord. Jimmy. A two-tier justice system. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always learned a long time ago, what's good for the goose is what? Good for the gander, right? Yeah, Sandy. Self-serving politicians. Yes, all that gets caught up in the political mess rather than doing what the people elect them and send them in office to do. Absolutely. What are some other areas that bring frustration and uh, anger uh, and wrath to people's lives? People don't like criticism. Thank you, Lita. Well, you know, we call it constructive criticism. And yet, I, I was reading in a book one day where constructive criticism is not always seen as constructive criticism. Some people see it more as destructive criticism. I think that's true, and I think it's probably the way that we receive that, accept it, maybe the attitude in which we, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we're caught. Have you ever noticed that you uh, might agree on one day and not be frustrated about the same thing a week later that frustrates you? Could it be our attitude and the venue in which we come across those? Yeah, that's a good one, Lita. Bobby. Drug dealers. drug dealers, yes. The drug trafficking that is going on and, and with gangs and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, drug uh, traffickers, drug dealers, uh, human sex trafficking, it is... It is really incredibly upsetting and distressing to realize the millions and billions of dollars that are made on that industry as well as the pornography industry. Okay, somebody else wanted something else. Yes, over here, D. <laughs> I was wondering when somebody was going to bring that up. Rude drivers. Now, under the umbrella of rude drivers, would that encompass slow drivers that are going about uh, 10 in a 30-mile zone? Yes. Do what, Sandra? Not stopping at stop signs. Well, the only thing I can say for those that don't stop, it, oh, yeah, you're talking about the endangerment of somebody coming from a different direction. Yeah, Absolutely. Any other things that uh, frustrate you? Lita. Okay. Lita said, I don't like to hear people use the name of God in a, a, a vain way. Yes, I just said something to someone uh, just this very day about that particular thing. You know, they were using Jesus' name in a profane way. And, uh, I, you know, I just had to make a comment. I sometimes let those things pass, and sometimes I don't. And, uh, yes, to take the name of God in vain. You know, the Jewish people, and we're studying about the Jews here in the book of Esther, but the Jewish people were so incredibly, had reverence for God's name that they were even afraid to write it, that they would miswrite it. Yes, the vanity and the blasphemy of the name of God. I'll tell you something else, and I want to reiterate this because somebody thanked me for doing it. I think it might have been in Sunday school class. It might have been here on Wednesday night. But nonetheless, I remember making the statement, I hate to get a Christmas card with X-M-A-S. My God is not an X. He's known. He's known. His name is God, the great I am. And uh, so if you send Christmas cards this year, don't, don't try to make that shorthand. Put who we are rightfully honoring and celebrating. But I get lots of cards throughout Christmas time, and many of them will be XMAS. I'd rather not get the card. I really would. 
because as Lita said a few moments ago, to me that puts Christmas in a whole nother level. What are some other things that make you furious? Uh, Julia. Wokeism. Okay, wokeism is another thing that has divided the country and all of the things that fall under the umbrella of the wokeism. Yes, somebody else over here. Jenny. Someone lying to you. Okay, that's a good one. Bible says thou shalt not lie, doesn't it? Aline. Shoddy workmanship. Thank you, Aline. I've always been a stickler. If you're going to do something, do it well. Do it right. Give it all you've got. Uh, we sing that old hymn, Ken's Let Us In, Our Best. Our best, our all. Thank you, Aline. And I know being in a professional uh, job that you were in, that, that that was paramount to you. And I always felt that way as I was a teacher in school. If you're going to do it, do it right. Teach it right. Put some work into it and enthusiasm and, and yes, that's, that's a great, we've become very sloppy in our world at where we live. Well, I want to, anybody else want to comment before I move on? Yes, right back here, Sandra. <laughs> if somebody knows your what? Sandra said, not returning phone calls. Yeah. Yeah, you know what happens whenever you don't return phone calls? I think generally figure one of two things. What have I done? They don't like me. Or, and there are maybe other excuses, but uh, I think that is important. Returning them. Now, you may be a day late, but you know, when Jesus was four days late, he was still on time. So all of these things that bring confusion, frustration, anger, hostility, um, all of these things, and I want you to think for me just a minute, don't raise your hand, how many of you are on blood pressure medication? <laughs> Do you realize what all of that does to the vascular system that you and I deal with on a daily basis? All of these things that frustrate, that anger us, and it all works against our health. It's interesting to me, in verse 21, here's the, the scene. Mordecai is sitting in the king's gate. There's lots of activity that's flourishing in this setting, in this venue. And then there's two of the king's eunuchs. They are his bed chamber doorkeepers to make sure that he is kept safe. And notice the phrase, became furious. Became furious. What was it that created the furiousness of these two doorkeepers? I think only you and I could surmise. We're not told what it was that brought the furiousness into this particular setting and their moment. I thought, what about maybe could they be angry because there's a new queen in town? Could they be angry because maybe Vashti had been very kind to them? Maybe they're angry because the king has vanquished her as if she never existed. Maybe it was that situation. Maybe it was the idea that others were gaining promotions that did not be needed to be put in some of the places that were there. I, I mean, I think the, our minds could surmise all kinds of things. We're not told what uh, caused the furiousness in this particular moment but they became furious. And that word furious, when you use that word, it is speaking about incredible, an incredible buildup of an anger that had so encircled them to the, fact, to the point that they wanted to assassinate this king that they had been picked in order to protect. 
They're furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. <clears throat> Verse 22 tells us, so the matter became known to Mordecai. Do you think it was any coincidence? Do you think it was by a draw of luck that Mordecai sat there on that particular day, at that particular time, in order to hear an assassination plot against the king? Let me tell you, <clears throat> once again, the sovereignty of Almighty God is working through Mordecai to hear this plot because Mordecai will be the one who will pass it on to the queen knowing that the Jews are in a precarious situation at best through the years as they have become exiles out of their country. So the matter became known to Mordecai who told Queen Esther and then notice what Esther did. Esther could have kept that to herself, but she didn't. Esther informed the king in notice Mordecai's name. She didn't go trying to seek a brownie point for herself, but she goes and pays tribute to whom tribute was due of a man that saved the king from an assassination plot the other night on television. They were doing another one of the Kennedy documentaries. And there's been all kinds of, there are those that, that don't believe the Warren report. There are those that feel like there was a great conspiracy cover-up. And when Jack Ruby shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald, and his mother was making comments uh, about that he was working for the United States federal government as well as for the Russian government. And so it's always been a big issue of who really assassinated John F. Kennedy who was behind all of that. And here we are since 1963, and we're in 2023, and they're still uh, in the people's minds, for the most part, people still have their own idea of uh, who was behind the assassination plot of John F. Kennedy, and that will never probably ever be uh, be totally clarified to the American people regardless of the Warren report that people did not believe. And so therefore, uh, there's always been hanging chads, if you will, of what people believe about that situation. Well, Mordecai's in a situation. He overhears an assassination plot. He gets it firsthand. It's not hearsay evidence. And once again, I think that's another thing that you and I can glean from this verse. That Mordecai didn't hear from ten people back that the story changed time and time again. He heard it firsthand. He knew exactly what was said. He knew exactly to whom he needed to share the information because he was confident of the fact that Esther, whom he had reared himself, had taught her well that she would take the information straight to the king and... Um, he probably did not know that she would inform the king in Mordecai's own name, but Esther did that which was right. She honored his wishes, but she also honored the name of Mordecai. Once again, think with me. The God of heaven and earth, he's working behind the scenes. He knows that Mar Mordecai's name needs to be um, recorded somewhere, and so God is working in the midst of this. Notice verse 23. 
And when an inquiry was made into the matter, in other words, they're going to investigate this. They're not going to just take what Esther has brought that Mordecai has passed on to her, but they're going to do an investigation to determine the truth of this uh, situation that's been brought to the king. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, notice it was confirmed. Important information. <clears throat> you and I pass over some of these little menial things in verses when they are huge things in the great scheme of what's happening here in the citadel, Shishan, uh, the palace, and what's taking place. It was confirmed. <clears throat> And notice the next phrase, and both were hanged on a gallows. Now, that word hanged, uh, it was probably they were impaled on sticks or rods as was used during those days. Um, They didn't probably have a rope around their neck, but they're impaled. And oftentimes in those ancient days and ancient kings and governments would put their victims out somewhere in the town square or outside the city gate to warn people of uh, what would happen to them if they uh, did anything that went against their government. And so you and I see that in worlds where there is uh, autocracy, in worlds where there is, uh, like in North Korea, or like in China, I saw this week, where uh, they are trying to redistribute the wealth across the Chinese nation. And so uh, why do they do that? More than anything, I don't know that it's always for the welfare of the people as it is for the popularity of those that are in power in order to be able to get the people behind them to do whatever they want to do at their own bidding. But it's confirmed, these two men, they're hanged uh, on a gallows, and it was written. Now, here's the other phrase that's important in verse 23. It wasn't just examined to find out, is it true? Then they find out it was, the confirmation was exactly as told, and then swift justice was immediately done. Do do you know something right here? Another thing that we see, let's just take America, crimes that are committed. People wind up, oftentimes on death row for how long? 20 years. Taxpayers have paid all of this money that I think is wasted money. Could be used to feed the poor. Could be used to help drill clean water systems for children in third world countries. But nonetheless, it's the way we do things. And things go through and through the justice systems over and over and over. Let me tell you, in ancient days, that's not the way they handled things. Injustices were done. Swift justice was taken immediately and handled. Now, you can only imagine when people would see impaled criminals up on these uh, sticks that hung in the air and bodies impaled on them. You can only imagine that it would be a deterrent to those who might think twice before they committed whatever crime it was they were going to commit. But the important thing here in verse 23, it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. It was no accident. It was no coincidence. It was not by luck or chance that it happened the way that it happened. God, once again, is moving, working. I think one of the biggest things you and I will learn someday when we all get to heaven, Ken led in that old 
him, uh, we'll understand it better by and by one of these days. I think one of the things that you and I will understand better by and by uh, of the things that, that God has in his books, plural, about our lives once we become a child of the king, and then what do we do with life from there? And it was written in the book of the Chronicles, that word Chronicles, they chronicled everything about the Persian government, things that <clears throat> were vital, things that were hugely important. They are chronicled in books that the Persian government had. <clears throat> but this particular entry was journaled in the presence of the king. That will be hugely important. Notice, if you will, in chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, what things? Well, the crowning of a new queen, an assassination plot that had been confirmed, the hanging of the two perpetrators against the plot against the king, and then the chronicling of this particular incident that gave Mordecai a Jew, which is still not yet known, <clears throat> all of those things. So when you read after these things, uh, you know, the Bible is replete about some of these things. We'll see after these things, um, or after these things, so it came down about, or in those days, we see those phrases and those become uh, major transitional points as we move to a new thought here. <clears throat> after these things, everything that took place in chapters 1 and 2, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman. Well, Haman was a guy that you didn't want to have too much to do with. Haman absolutely hated the Jews. And here's another thing that I want to heavily emphasize tonight. The Jews have been hated since the beginning that God chose them as his chosen people. We looked the other night, and I believe there were, what, 14,800,000 Jews presently in the world. You know that Hitler uh, assassinated, killed, incinerated, uh, shot, starved to death at least 6 million Jews back then, not to mention all the other uh, autocratic and uh, kings and the way they did the Jewish people. They've been scattered all over the world from uh, many, many years ago. And uh, one of the reasons we know we're living in end times is because they, the Bible tells us that they would be brought back to their homeland. And of course, that all began in May of 1948, and the Jewish nation uh, became a nation in one day's time. The Bible had predicted that's the way it would be. And so the regathering of the Jews to their homeland. God said over in the book of Genesis chapter 12, I believe it is verse 3, I'll bless those that bless Israel, and I'll curse those that curse Israel. You and I are living in a time in American history where there's a lot of anti-Semitism, anti-against, or in place of Semitism, speaking of the Jewish people. We see that, uh, that the Jews are being maligned. Jews and Christians are being maligned at every turn of the road in the world that you and I are living in today. And let me tell you, there's nothing Satan would love than for the Jewish people to be destroyed 
But I can tell you, as long as the stars are in the heavens, the Bible says they're going to be there. Let me tell you, when there's not enough of them to fight, I'll tell you, the God of heaven will fight for them. And he'll use whatever means in order to uh, fight in their defense. Now, Haman, let's talk about him. Who is he? Verse 1 of chapter 3 says he's the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Well, who were they? Well, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. Who were the Amalekites? Well, do y'all remember Jacob and Esau? Any of you remember them? Those two brothers? The Amalekites were from the lineage of Esau. And uh, the Amalekites always were enemies. They were forever uh, foes of the Jews. When the Jewish people were emancipated uh, and liberated from Egyptian bondage, the Amalekites were some of the ones that attacked them. And what the Amalekites would do, where does hatred come from? Now, we all know hatred sin, right? We all know that we're born into sin, right? But let me tell you, where do little kids learn to put on the KKK garb? Where do they learn, who do they learn it from? Their parents. Where did the Amalekites, uh, where did all of the hatred for the Jewish people come into play with them? Let me tell you, they taught their children. They instilled within them hatred. Let me tell you, today, children grow up the way that they are taught through whatever the prejudices are of the parents or the grandparents. Those prejudices, those hatreds become part of generational passings of information that create all of these types of things. And so Haman automatically, at this particular juncture, in verse 1 of chapter 3, Haman doesn't know that Mordecai is a Jew. He doesn't know Esther is a Jew. But d- deep in his lineage, in his background, he, the, they hate the Jewish people. Now, if you'll remember when Saul, King Saul, the first king of the nation of the Jewish people, God told Saul to get rid of the Amalekites. Well, and their livestock and all their families. Now, you might say, well, why why would God do that? Doesn't that sound awfully cruel? I mean, need to mention a while ago uh, about children and the way they're maligned and mistreated and abused and, and all of those kinds of things. Why would God tell King Saul to rid the Jewish people of the Amalekites? I'll tell you why, because I read somewhere that God is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He knows the beginning to the end, the end to the beginning. He knows before it ever, ever came to be. God knows what the Amalekites were going to be, what they were going to become. They were going to become a stumbling block to the Jewish people. And God told Saul to rid the nation of those people. Guess what Saul did? Saul decided, boy, they had some pretty good-looking sheep. And so Saul kept, chose the choicest, healthiest, the ones that would have won 
the blue ribbon and the trophy in the State Fair of Oklahoma. He chose the best of the stock, and he kept it. And not only that, he let the king, Agag, live. Well, God had plan B, since Saul didn't carry out plan A, and Saul was disobedient to the command of Almighty God. So God had a guy by the name of Samuel. You ever heard about him? His mother Hannah gave him over, remember, to the priest at uh, a place called Shiloh to mentor him. Hannah was barren. She wanted a child. She prayed desperately for a child. She prayed to God, if you'll give me a child, I will give him to you all of his days. And she had that little boy, Samuel. And you'll remember that three times in the night he thought the priest was calling him Eli. And Eli said, if, if you hear the voice again, it's the Lord. And it was the Lord that was calling Samuel. Samuel would be God's prophet. He would proclaim during those days. And so Samuel went and took care of Agag, killed him with the sword because of something Saul had been commanded by God to do and Saul did not take care of the business, which had created incredible challenges for the Jewish people. Haman, Esther chapter 3, verse 1, Haman is a relative down through the lineage of those ghastly, ungodly, paganistic people that hated the Jews. So, we've looked at the first part of verse 1. Go to the uh, connecting word there, the conjunction and. And what did Ahasuerus do? He advanced Haman and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Remember, there's 127 provinces in the Persian Empire. It was huge. It's been one of the greatest and the well-known of all the ancient empires of the ancient world. Haman? Why on earth did he get the advancement? Mordecai, you're the one that foiled the assassination plot. You're the one that saved the king's life. You're the one that they recorded it in the chronicles in the presence of the king. Why on earth did he choose this guy? Let me tell you once again, sovereignty is at play. Sovereignty's at work. God's going to get rid of him, but he's going to do it his way and in his time. Now let me say in verse 1, I want you to think about the people in particular jobs, the job market, job placement. Many of them that are hard workers, they give an honest day's wages. As Aline said a few moments ago, they don't do shoddy work. They try to do the right thing for the right reasons, for the right purposes, for the right number of pay. But sometimes they're overlooked when it comes to promotions. Have you ever seen that happen? Why did oh so-and-so get that? I'm the more qualified. Let me tell you, in the world that you and I live in today, there are people that have deep pockets. Must I go any further? Can you read between the lines? Some people can pay their way through and up the ladder. And that's the way it happens in our world. It goes back to the word, I think one of you used Jimmy uh, I believe used the injustices of a two-tiered system uh, that we have in our world. You see, I think all of those things are things that bring disgust and frustration and division and divide in the world that you and I live in. And we see it all over the world. Some people are promoted, some people are elevated to higher positions when there sometimes are better people that are much more qualified. They may not have the degree, 
but they can do the work. And they're gifted. And so many times, many of those people feel brokenhearted. They, some people obviously continue throughout a lifetime of holding judges or grudges, excuse me. Maybe they hold the judges too, but they hold grudges. And I want you to think about all of those kinds of injustices that bring stress and undue problems to the elasticity of the vascular system, which creates incredible medical issues for us. And here's a guy, he's a Jew hater. He's anti-Semitic. He'll let the cat out of the bag soon. We'll see. And it's all in God's plan that all of these people nestled throughout the verses of the book of Esther, that God is working his Rubik's Cube to get them in the right position at the right time, at the right place for his eternal purposes that he wills and they will be carried out. Let's look at verse 2 and then I'm going to let you go here. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gates bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. That's a really packed verse that verse is incredibly filled and all the king's servants, King Ahasuerus, why in creation would you put a man like Haman in a position where he wants self-worship? He wants to be idolized as not only the second in command of the Persian government, but he wants to be worshiped as a God himself. Ahasuerus, what are you thinking? I mean, boy, that's a stupid, idiotic thing to have done. Where on earth is your discernment and your intuition of whatever you're choosing behaviors and characteristics of people to put into a position of second in command. Goodness gracious, King Ahasuerus, you're not nearly quite as smart as I thought you were. Can you only imagine the thoughts that roam through the various rooms of the brain about this particular king and the one he had chosen? Notice all the people would bow. When Haman came to the gate, he loved it. You talk about self-aggrandizement. You talk about somebody who believed his own press reports. That's one of the big problems we have in America today. There's too many of them that believe their press reports. Folks, I learned a long time ago, don't believe all your press reports that you hear. Notice they come to the king's gate. Oh, they bow before him. They honor him. They reverence him. But there's one there that's not going to do it. It reminds me of the three in the furnace in the book of Daniel. They looked and there was a fourth one in there. Likened to the Son of God. Let me tell you, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend. And they did not compromise. I want you to notice Mordecai, he stayed true to his Jewish heritage. In fact, in the Torah, which was the law of Moses, which would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in that the law of Moses, and in the Torah, the book, the law, one of the things that they were commanded in the Shema was 
to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. They were not to have any other gods before him in the Ten Commandments. They were not to worship idols. They were not to worship kings. They were, do you remember over in the book of Revelation when John, the revelator, bowed at the angel? Remember what the angel said? Oh, don't, don't worship me. Worship only God alone. Angels are just created beings. And the psalmist said that he's made man a little lower than the angels. And angels are not to be worshipped. And I'm afraid there's lots of people that worship angels. There's people that just absolutely worship angels. Hebrews said those were created beings to minister to those who will inherit salvation. That's why they were created. God has a warring angel called Michael. He is the watch care angel over the nation of Israel. Gabriel is the announcing angel. He announced the virgin birth. And so what we have here is from the Amalekite lineage, uh, this guy that hates Jews, so he's anti-Semitic. But Mordecai has determined, has vowed in his heart, he's going to stand in the midst of this situation. I had somebody today text me, one of our members said, Pastor Randy, they're already gearing up to shut down the churches again for COVID. And he said, I'm not going to be shut down. And I texted back and said, I'm not either. If I'm the only one there, we're meeting. Enough of that. COVID's here to stay. It's like the flu. It's here to stay. It's going to be here to stay. But let me tell you, Mordecai had made a determination in his heart. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to bow. I'm not compromising. And I'm certainly not bowing to this cat that the king appointed. And so that, right there, Mordecai is a marked man by a Jewish hater by the name of Haman. And we'll pick it up there. As Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story next time. God bless you for being here tonight. Please be safe. Pray much between now and Sunday that we'll have another great day here at New Hope. Would you stand as we pray together? Father God, thank you for the blessings through the Holy Spirit that you reveal to us through your word. Thank you for this good group. Thank you for their willingness, their devotion, their commitment. And for those that listen to this broadcast and those that have listened in tonight, God help us that we would grow, that we would learn, that we would enlarge our coast. Help us, O oh God, that our spiritual, biblical territory would enlarge in our knowledge of what you would have us to apply to our daily lives. Take each one safely home. Return us back on Sunday morning. And Father, give us a great Sunday, I pray. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you for being here tonight.